Welcome everybody to another exciting week here at Dr. Crow's Bird Show. Today my co-host is Charlene. She is a buff Orpington chicken and she's here to talk to us today about Easter eggs. <laughs> and we're also joined by a guest member of the flock. We have Nigel Osborne, the founder and director of eggtruth.com. Thank you so much for being here. Welcome. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on, Liz. And Charlene is gorgeous. She's Thank beautiful. You. Well, I'd, I'd like to take credit for it, but she's the one that catches all the worms. So before we get into it, uh, we're going to do a little bit of or an overview about Easter eggs. How did Easter eggs even become a thing in the first place associated with Easter and a tradition in terms of something that we've decided that are worth hunting for? one Sunday out of the year. Uh, my information comes primarily from an article called The History of the Hunt, How an Easter Tradition Was Hatched. This was written in 2018 by Dr. Andrew Hahn. In the article, they say, in many pre-Christian societies, eggs held associations with spring and new life. Early Christians adapted these beliefs, making the egg a symbol of the resurrection and the empty shell a metaphor for Jesus' tomb. Uh, we actually had an episode, Nigel, I don't know if you got a chance to listen, about sacred birds. It's interesting that uh, the egg is actually also a sacred symbolic metaphor. I never knew that. I mean, I think like most people growing up, it doesn't matter what the holiday tradition is. It's just something that's always done. You inherit it from your parents and just culturally everyone around you. And I never knew that that was the case. I'm not surprised. Religious traditions and those kinds of things are the motivation or the source of a lot of traditions, but uh, that I didn't know. We grew up dying eggs and doing the Easter egg hunt, but we yeah. never really did the whole like church part of it. We did like the arts and crafts component to it. That was pretty fun with the vinegar and the little pellets that you drop in. So we used to do that at school. I have very vivid memories of, I remember taking the, the egg mm -hmm. and putting a little hole in the egg with a pin and blowing yes. out the egg and painting the egg. That was, that was something we would do every year in, in public school. Obviously, yeah. you, know, you didn't do that. And then, of course, you know, chocolate entered the, the tradition, the, the equation, the commercial component of it. So certainly remember all that. But the Easter egg hunt, it's funny, you just never question those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. No, it's true. And now that you mention it, I remember blowing the eggs out and almost passing out in the process. So <laughs> it's really hard to get it out that time. Yeah. Back in the medieval times, eating eggs was actually forbidden during Lent. The first 40 days before Easter Sunday, they weren't allowed to eat eggs at all. That's probably another reason why Easter eggs became such an important part of the tradition is not only did they have that symbolic component, but also you could finally eat something other than, well, nothing. Right. It was a real treat for people. And they also um, would give them as gifts and as Good Friday offerings. I find it not unusual from the religious standpoint that they would look at eggs and mm -hmm. the female, the hen, as sort of the source of life, this renewal of life or generation of life and spring and all of those things mixed together. I mean, it's funny how we revere those things. Mm -hmm. uh, again, whether in religious traditions or culturally, and then then we take those things that we revere and as it relates to animals, we suddenly, we end up exploiting it in ways mm -hmm. that for something of such reverence, it's kind of a contradiction. It is a contradiction. It brings up the idea of hunting. A lot of hunters will say that part of why they're out there is they just like being outside and in nature, yet they associate that with hunting. Well, when did Easter eggs go from just being something that we ate and decorated to something that we actually hunted? Do you have any guesses as to which European country that started in? European country. Uh, Not to put you on the spot or anything. <laughs> oh, England. Close. You're very close. Queen Victoria actually was a huge fan of Easter egg hunts. So you are very close and have reason to pick England. But it's actually first started in Germany. Some suggest its origins date back to the 16th century when Protestant reformer Martin Luther organized mm. egg hunts for his congregation. So back then, the men would hide the eggs from the women, which was supposed to be a nod to the story of the resurrection in which the empty tomb was discovered by women. Traditions are so, so bizarre. On one hand, I understand why people sometimes, they stick and adhere to traditions because it's somehow a connection to their past, mm -hmm. to their ancestry, but they never question them. Mm -hmm. Like I said at the outset, you know, I never really wondered or thought about where these things come from. 
if it's something that you did and your grandparents did and their parents before them did, even for just a few generations, it's not really questioned. It's just sort of what you do, you know. <laughs> and that brings up a final funny tradition that I read about in doing research for today's episode, which was that egg rolling was actually a really big deal, apparently, in Britain and Scotland. They would all gather at the 1790s and they would roll decorated eggs down grassy hills. Sounds fascinating. <laughs> it's pretty rad. <laughs> I'm surprised it's not an Olympic event today. Well, you know, we all remain indoors long enough and you never know, it could be the next big thing, which brings us to a perfect entry point for the flocking news. The flocking news. Today's flocking news article comes out of the New York Times, published on the 28th of March, and it's called America Stress Bought All the Baby Chickens. A quote from the article is, the combination of an enormous rise in unemployment, anxious free time for those not struggling with illness, and financial instability has created a number of strange moments in economics. Here's another. For the next few weeks, baby chickens are next to impossible to find. Apparently, when times are tough, people want chickens. Chick sales go up during stock market downturns and in presidential election years. A hatchery executive in the article named Tom Watkins was quoted as saying, people are panic buying chickens like they did toilet paper. Yeah. And finally, quote, uh, many feed stores report they are selling out of chicks almost as fast as they can get new orders in. Some of these buyers are simply replenishing their flocks, having put in orders weeks or months ago. But many people who have bought chicks in the last week are first timers. As someone who has his finger on the pulse of the egg and hatchery industry, what are some of your thoughts, Nigel, on what's going on with the panic buying? I'm not surprised. In Montreal, uh, the SPCA has already reported an uptick in the number of hens that have been abandoned and dropped off at animal shelters. And this is, there's going to be a huge wave of this after this pandemic subsides. What I also find incredibly shocking is mailing chicks in the mail. They do it in Canada and Mm -hmm. everything I know and have seen over the years, I'm still shocked that we can treat these animals Mm -hmm. like things. Mm -hmm. Like we're ordering from Amazon. It's just a click away and some living beings are going to show up in a box at your front door. I'm surprised that, you know, others haven't tried to stop this one of my first waves of sadness, I guess, when I was reading this article was just thinking about all of the male chicks at these hatcheries, because as they're ramping up production, nobody wants roosters. Like, let's just face it. I mean, not only are there housing ordinances zoned against it so that you can't legally have a rooster, but they don't produce eggs, a big thing that people are wanting in terms of panic buying. Through our social media channels at Egg Truth, we get a couple of different commenters and responses. We get people who are are of the vegan and animal rights sort of dead set against any use or exploitation. And then there's the others who often comment about, I raise my own chickens and they're happy birds and they'll denounce the large scale commercial operations, but embrace this as a higher ethical standard. I guess while on one hand, it is a nicer life for a bird to be living in a backyard that's being taken care of, but it still falls short of a minimal ethical standard Mm -hmm. because it doesn't matter where they come from. Yeah, these male chicks are being culled en masse and there's still all the issues and problems of pullets and the female had all hens, all the disease and illnesses and reproductive health issues that go on as a result. It really is hard to tell ethically. Uh, It's not a black and white situation at all because for all the evils of the commercialized size endeavors, they do large scale immunizations to the chicks so that they'll be inoculated against certain diseases like Newcastle disease. And one of the unintended consequences that can happen with backyard chicken keeping is they're in more contact with wild birds. So that could actually inadvertently spread another pandemic of something like bird flu One of the first ways that that can be introduced into a flock is through interactions with wild birds. And so you have this very bucolic scene, right, that they're eating worms in the backyard. And I know that I'm the total hypocrite in the room here because I get all kinds of joy watching my flock in the backyard 
even interacting with wild birds is, I mean, it's so cute when they like run after a little blue jay or something, but you <laughs> right. know, there's a, there's a shadow side to all of this, just like, you know, yeah. Easter eggs are beautiful, but there's a shadow side to their production. Right. The backyard chicken issue is, you know, I, I, I confess I struggle with it a little bit because, you know, we, we promote egg free, not cage free. And that's important to me because mm -hmm. I don't want to get into the gray areas. I don't want to get into the ambiguity of this issue. I'm trying to, you know, say to people, look, that even if you go local, you go organic, you have your backyard chickens, many of them are going to die prematurely because mm -hmm. there's no way around the, the genetics of who and what they are today. And you're going to replenish those backyard chickens. You're either going to rescue them from a battery farm or you're going to get them from somewhere. I've, I've talked to a number of people who've talked about the hormonal implants for egg cessation in many of the, the birds that they rescue. I hear from a lot of people that not only does the egg cessation prolong their life and reduce the risk of reproductive cancers, but they even are happier or content. They can even see as the implants start to wane after three or four months, they can see a behavior change in the animals. They become a little irritable and a little more aggressive and a little, a little less happy. There's a big consequence to using these things. I know they're expensive, but it's not just the, the physical aspect of it, but the general well-being of the bird as a whole. Mm -hmm. That is the perfect segue into bird tales. Bird tales. For today's bird tales, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the story of my backyard flock and the steep learning curve that we had to do together in order to get uh, to where we are today, which is probably not even as far as where we need to go <laughs> eventually. But mm. I grew up raising chickens, uh, and like I said, it was something where we would just get them in the mail. Like I didn't even necessarily think too much about it because it was just sort of what we do. We lived out in the country. Um, mm -hmm. We didn't eat our chickens, but we did eat their eggs. And I also raised like some guinea fowl and stuff like that. And we had a pond, so I'd also raise geese and ducks. And honestly, it was like one of my favorite things ever that really sort of ignited, ironically, some of my passion in birds now because here I am sort of on the other side of the fence knowing what I do know now, which like you said, does imply that perhaps this isn't really necessarily a tenable situation. It wasn't until I was a little bit older and had my own backyard flock that I realized some of the ethical quagmires. So the first chickens that we had here, uh, I did get at a feed store because I thought, okay, that's just where you get, you know, chickens from. And we actually had this horrible situation where one of our dogs had gotten into where the chickens were and there was this whole horrible traumatic event that wiped out most of that flock. I only had a few survivors. I needed to get some chickens who were older, around the same age as them, so that they could have some other chickens to grow up with because chickens are very social animals and, and they do need to be in a flock in order to feel secure uh, in just the most basic sense. That brought me to trying to research more like local options. By now I was more aware of what was happening in commercialized hatcheries. I was already peripherally aware, to be honest, but I didn't want to look at it. I didn't want to think about it because it was just too hard and sad. What they were doing was like debeaking chicks and stuff. So now I thought to myself, well, I'm going to really go ahead and try and find like someone local with multi-generational born chicks. And I found a lady online and I went to her house and Honestly, there were some red flags that in hindsight, I probably should have looked at in terms of cleanliness and stuff like that. I got just a few um, chickens from her and one actually ended up being a rooster, but he was a really nice guy. So it was fine. <laughs> <laughs> we love Robin. He was a good guy. Yeah. But uh, a bunch of them actually ended up passing away within days because they had coccidiosis, which occurs naturally in dirt, I guess, around the mm -hmm. world. If they don't have any kind of inoculation to it, then it can easily overwhelm their system, particularly if their system's already weakened by some other kind of illness or something like that. And it's highly contagious from one yeah. chick's poop um, to another chick. Not only were we kind of devastated from what had happened with the dog situation, now we were burying these young chickens and yep. kind of like back at square one and it was really traumatic and we did have a handful of survivors you know come out after that but 
it's ethically and morally kind of a quagmire and it doesn't necessarily get much easier not to scare people who already panic bought their chickens like toilet paper. Right. As your chickens get a little bit older, you will discover that they start to have more and more issues with their reproductive systems. One of the things yeah. that we've done as humans is we've engineered their bodies to lay hundreds of eggs year round, which is not at all what their wild jungle fowl ancestors used to do. Their yeah. wild jungle fowl ancestors used to lay like a clutch or two every spring, raise right. their kids, go about their business the rest of the year and then repeat the next year would only be laying like maybe 60 eggs a year tops if that and now they lay upwards of over 300 a year what that does is it really takes a toll on their bodies not only is it a challenge to keep up in terms of calcium and nutrition they can get egg bound they can have what's called egg yolk peritonitis and i've actually lost a couple hens that were really close to me one from that original flock that survived the dog attack uh right. she was as friendly, if not even more than Charlene here. And that was really, really devastating, like losing a family member. And it was all because we've engineered them for their eggs. And then we got into trying to microchip the chickens. As you had mentioned, you can get the subdermal implant that will stop them from ovulating. We had one hen that we did do that for. Her name was Skunk. It was very hard to find a vet who would do it. In the United States, the FDA bans using any kind of chips like that in any food animal. And so even though we don't eat our chickens, you still can't find many who are willing to do it just because they don't want to risk their own veterinary license. If you can find one that's willing to do it, they're very, very expensive. They're about $200 every three months and you have to keep doing them basically year round. I did not know that the FDA prohibited that. In Canada, I could be wrong, but I do not think that there's any restriction on that. Through my volunteer work at Happily Ever Esther Farm Sanctuary, one of the animal caregivers there, the specialist, Andrea White, she's a bird lady. She loves the birds. The birds love her. She knows their behavior, their personalities better than anybody. They don't do all the birds, but they do uh, some of them, the ones that are the greatest risk. You just can't so, afford it to do your entire flock. I mean, at least for us, we have five hens right now. And so $200 every three months. That's a thousand bucks <laughs> yeah, or more. But I, I, I didn't know that they were prohibited like that by the FDA. They assume that chickens are just, they're just categorized as a food animal. There's no exception for even if it was like a pet chicken that someone was keeping in a, a city apartment, <laughs> they still consider that to be a food animal. It's crazy. But, uh, yeah, it is. It is crazy. It shows you how far behind we are in terms of having our regulations match what we actually need to have happen if we're going to sort of undo the ramifications of the genetic engineering that we've been doing to these birds. And, you know, the FDA and the USDA are two agencies in the U.S. that are a prime example of regulatory capture. The policies that flow out of those agencies are written and drafted by the animal agricultural sector mm -hmm. and the pharmaceutical sector. Well, and the Animal Welfare Act specifically excludes animals used in agriculture and birds and also animals used in scientific experiments as well, which basically means, well, you can't be charged with animal cruelty as long as it benefits uh, somebody who already has a vested interest in it. You know, you mentioned earlier about wild birds and kind of volume and frequency that they would lay in nature in the absence of human intervention. But a farm in Iowa and a farm in Germany last year, early 2019, both reached in their flocks 500 eggs before the barns were deflocked and sent to slaughter. So it was the first time that they reached that milestone. Well, it's insane. Um, Even since the 1970s, it's increased quite substantially. I think the average number in the 1970s was, um, you know, 100, 150 a year or something like that. It's not even talking crazy. about the quote unquote meat chickens and all no. the issues that they have because their bodies are now engineered to grow so fast that it breaks their own legs if they live too long, meaning even a year. 45 days from birth to slaughter for birds used for meat. It's truly astonishing the speed and this curve that we have manipulated these animals now to the point that I find it ironic that when people talk about GMO food, they think of apples and vegetables. And I always remind people when it comes up, the animals that you are consuming, those are genetically modified organisms as well. 
Well, and the sheer scale is just astronomical. You look at the number of chickens on the planet, and it's in the billions. And well, Fonalytics, uh, just not that long ago, a, a number of weeks ago, released their slaughter statistics. Looking at the number of animals slaughtered, I think poultry, so turkeys, egg-laying hens, and chickens, a race for meat, uh, constituted, I don't know, something like almost 90% of all animals slaughtered on the planet. Poultry has gone nuts over the last 20 years. Yeah, something like close to 70 billion. It's astronomical numbers, I can't even comprehend them. I think <laughs> you telling us to wrap it up, Charlene. <laughs> <laughs> Let's switch to some eggless ideas from Easter in our segment, A Bird of Advice. A bird of advice. <laughs> so uh, I had some help with this, but interestingly, some of these things I actually remember myself as a kid. <laughs> and one of them is this one. So it's Easter string eggs using a balloon or water balloon, depending on which one you want. You blow up the balloon or you fill it with water and you create a paste, something like a paper mache that you drag your string through, you wrap it around the balloon, and then once it dries, you pop the balloon, but this egg-shaped ornament, presumably what you can do with these is get those little chocolate Easter eggs inside the balloon, blow them up, so when you do yeah. pop the balloon, those Easter eggs are inside the string eggs so that kids can, you know, yay, you know, yeah. things and get the chocolate, vegan chocolate uh, Easter eggs set. Well, so that's, that's a great idea. The other thing that I, I never did, and, and as a kid, and, but I think it's kind of cool, is uh, salt dough Easter egg. Yes, yes, I read about these. Where you can make your own ornaments just using salt, dough, and mm -hmm. water. You create a little hole in them, and you can paint them and color them with it, whatever you want, whether with yeah. markers or with paint or, or what have you. And I love those because you can keep them year after year. So you right. can then like add to a, like a new ones every year and then you could even hide those in the yard. And for those who are listening, it's one cup flour, one half cup salt and one half cup water. And you just mix those together and you bake them low and slow at 250 degrees for a couple hours. And you can right. do any kind of cookie cutter shape that you want to do. And the example that you held up, they were doing like the egg shape and then they had used, I think, a straw to poke the hole. Yes. So you could hang them up later. So yeah, right. that's a great idea. Yeah, I love right. that one. And you can decorate uh, plants inside the house or even trees outside on the front yard. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. kind of like Christmas almost. And this I've actually seen in the stores before. I haven't seen it in a while. Recyclable plastic yes. Easter eggs kits that you can get and you can paint yourself. Mm -hmm. And they're reusable. No cooking required. They're plastic eggs. I think now that you mention it, I've seen in craft stores, sometimes they'll have like wooden eggs or there's all kinds right. of like fake eggs that you could get. And there is like the plastics issue, which kind of sucks, but yeah. at least it's not single use plastic if you do right. use it's recyclable. Them. And I do love your idea of like blowing up a balloon and putting something inside of it because again, we have the plastic thing, but it would like if you were a little kid or something and you got to pop a bunch of balloons and your parents were okay with it, like that would be so fun. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I like popping balloons. And then the other thing is, and now this is a bit more if you're into baking, vegan baking recipes, vegan cake, and mm -hmm. you can make these Easter egg pop cakes. And, oh, yeah. um, uh, but you can decorate them, right? You can yeah. get all the decorating stuff from the store to decorate them any way you want and it's all edible. Well, that's a good point too, that they're also round. So it's kind of like having little eggs. And I would argue that a cake pop is more delicious than a hard boiled egg any day. So. Well, for sure. Especially yeah. if it's pop inside. <laughs> Makes your kitchen smell good. better too. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Right. Anyone who's ever had a coworker that brought hard boiled eggs knows what I'm talking about. Unless you are yeah. that coworker. <laughs> but luckily there's a lot of really good egg alternatives out there. Mm. What was the one I just saw? They actually have like a... A, a patty? Yeah, there's actually a patty for like just breakfast eggs. sandwiches and stuff. Just eggs. Just eggs. Yeah, yeah that's Just cool. Foods is really kicking it when it comes to their worldwide distribution. They're opening up a couple of new uh, processing facilities, I think Midwest and Northeast United States, to keep up with demand. That's a and, good sign. Yeah, uh, but I'll tell you, I'm a big fan of vegan egg mm -hmm. by Earth Island. That is delicious, but we can get it anywhere near and it's really, really good. There's just so many alternatives. People forget that in like a recipe where you normally would have an egg, you can even do something as simple as substitute some applesauce or you can put in some chia seeds. Chia seeds. Yeah. Or yeah. alfalfa from uh, chickpea oh. water. But there's been egg replacer on the market for years and years and years and years. Mm -hmm. 
The other thing I, I wanted to mention, uh, something else that people can do at Easter time or any time for that matter, here is a, a little book for children. And it's called um, mm. Mercy, the, Mercy the Chicken. Uh, and the images are just, they're adorable for those of you who are listening. <laughs> it's about a, a chick that was born in a hatchery destined for a factory farm mm. and her escape. And it's beautifully illustrated. It's a wonderful little story, and it's produced by a woman by the name of Monica Lavella. And Monica is a friend of my wife, Krista. I'd love to get a copy. That little chick on the cover, well, both of the little chicks on the cover, Mercy, right. looks just like Charlene did when she was a oh, little. Oh, is that right? Oh, it, yes. Look, Charlene, there is a link on our website, egg-truth.com. There's a page okay. called Resources. And if you, it's for everything. It's for mm -hmm. a listing of all the animal sanctuaries in the world animal rights organizations, oh, wow. vegan recipes. It's a massive resource. And if you scroll down to the bottom, there's a section on books and there's a section for children's books. And the link for this for Amazon is there. Perfect. And all the proceeds from this book go to animal charities. Oh, that's even better. <laughs> and the other thing I wanted to mention too was The True Adventures of Esther the Wonder Pig. There's links there that people can go buy it for their kids, but you can actually browse through the whole book online. And it's right on EstherTheWonderPig.com. You can take your kids there. Because really, at the end of the day, how things are really, truly going to change in this mm -hmm. world is mm -hmm. you've got to start with kids. Mm -hmm. And these kind of books and these kind of stories are teaching children about animals, their worth, their importance, and compassion and empathy. So I think these are always great things any time of the year, whether it's Easter or Christmas or birthdays or whatever, it doesn't matter. Well, these would be great activities for folks that are stuck with homeschooling, but a nice way for the family to get together. Um, right. And I think that that's a really uh, important point and maybe the point of the entire episode, which is Easter is going to be a little bit different this year, but ultimately it's probably not even about the eggs. It's not really about the rabbits or the candy. No. It's about spending quality time together as a family. Right. And I think that uh, you've really driven that point home. Thank you for being here. I really appreciate you coming to the bird show. Hopefully someday you'll be back and we can yep. talk <laughs> on more than just panic buying during. <laughs> yes, happy <laughs> to come back anytime. Time. And thank you for having me on. It was a pleasure meeting Charlene. <laughs> well, thanks again for having me on. All right, thank you, Nigel. For everyone, we hope to see you next week for another Flocking Good Time. Show.